heart that forgives, a heart full of love, one with compassion just like yours above, one that overcomes evil with goodness and love, like it never happened, never holding a grudge, one a heart that forgives, that lives and lets live, one that keeps loving over and over again, one that men can offend because your word is within, one that loves without price like you, Lord Jesus Christ, one a heart that loves everybody, even my enemies. Wanna love like you, be like you, just like you did. I want a heart that forgives. I want a heart that forgives when the ones that are closest that I've known the longest. Hurt me the most. I still want to love them just like you love me, even though I'm hurting. I want a heart that forgives when the pain is so deep, it's so hard to speak about it to anyone, just like your son. I give up. I want a heart that loves everybody, even my enemies. I want to love like and be like and just like and did. I want to walk like and talk like, just like you did. I want to be like and live like, just like you did. Cause a heart that forgives is the heart that will live Totally free from the pain of the past And the heart that lets go is the heart that will know so much freedom Lord, I want to let it go God, I need to let it go Lord it's been holding me back and I don't want it I don't want it I don't I don't want it no more I don't know exactly what to do to get rid of it but here I am Lord Jesus here I am oh here I am Lord Jesus oh Lord you, I know this is me that you're talking to. This is me, this is me, this is me, Lord, this is me. Lord, I let it go. Every person, every person that's ever heard me, God, I let it go. Every single heart, God, I let it go. Every single pain, God, I Wow. Ooh. Normally, 
I'm going to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining FIRE. I'm your host for tonight's program. My name is Taylor Thomas. And tonight's guest, he's a national gospel recording artist, songwriter, author, and speaker. Yes, his name is Kevin LeVar. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Listen, you know, before we open the mic, I told you this is one of my favorite songs. What I didn't tell you is that I like to, when I when I first heard the song, I instantly had to cut off the lights and I just wanted to be in a particular space. And then when this came on, I didn't know the producers were going to put this one on. I had to grab my tissue. That is just such a powerful song, no matter where you are in life, the word forgiveness and to be able to do that. And you said in there to be able to forgive your enemies. Um, it just speaks volume. And I think now with all the things that are happening in the world today, we need to hear this. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, people are hurting. Uh, and that's the root cause for a lot of things that are happening right now. It's hurt when it's all said. And there's no way you can go through life without getting hurt, but it's what we do with that hurt that can define our lives, you know, and, and can cause so much problems, so many problems if we don't address it correctly, you know. Um, and so, yeah, it's this has been a song that has followed me and. I mean, people all around the world, it's been, I had no idea this song would impact people because I almost didn't put it on the record because it was so personal to me. And um, when I got in the studio and recorded it, I, well, first of all, I recorded it twice. I recorded it live in, uh, in DeSoto when we did the live recording, but I got so choked up that I couldn't use that recording because I, I just, I got so emotional. So I went into the studio and did another version. And towards the end, as you could hear, I kind of started getting a little choked up because I just was thinking about some of the things that I had gone through and um, and by God's grace was able to just forgive. It kind of started out as a uh, prayer first. Um, I just, I saw some of my mentors and some of my people in the industry that I really looked up to and I saw how they had hearts that were so open and so uh, hopeful and then life happened and they got jaded and they got hurt or disappointed and they had become calloused and so um, so defensive. And so one day I was just saying, God, you know, I, I want a heart that forgives. I want a heart that no matter what happens to me, because stuff is going to happen to all of us. I want to be able to forgive. I want to be able to bounce back. And so that's kind of where it came from. And then, you know, and then life happens, <laughs> you know. Yes, it does. Yeah. And Kevin LeVar, you are our first gospel recording artist That's on amazing. fire. <laughs> so why don't we commemorate this also by starting things the way you always do with prayer? Absolutely. Father, I love you so much. I thank you for every person uh, that's watching on tonight. And I pray that we say something, um, something is shared that would give them hope, uh, that would just give them peace in the midst of these uncertain times. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So we have to circle back to your roots. <laughs> so Kevin, I heard you're from the DMV, Washington, D.C. Born and raised. Born and raised. Born and raised. Eastern, right? I went to yes, I went to uh, I went to Eastern High School in uh, Northeast DC, uh, the Ramblers, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I shot them out. My so, dad, I, I grew up in DC, so yeah. So born and raised. Born and raised. Um, uh, I mean, my father was a police officer in DC for like 25, 26 years. So I grew up in a rough time, you know, back in the 80s, you know, when crack first hit. I mean, yes. you know, it was it was it was a really tough neighborhood. So God's grace. And um, but it was a family atmosphere. I grew up with my, my mom and dad. They they loved God. They loved us. Um, you know, I realize now you kind of look back and say, man. Um, we didn't have a whole, whole lot of money, but it sure didn't feel like we were, you know, poor. Like we were kind of, we were all right, you know. I think it's because God, you know, they gave us so much love. You know, I, you know, they, my father was a praying man. My mother was a praying woman. They kept us in church. Like, and so um, I remember going to the Boys and Girls Clubs. I was always in the neighborhood, but when Sunday came or when Tuesday came, and when Friday came, I was in church. So most of my friends were were like church kids. And, you know, it didn't stop us from acting a fool from time to time. But 
So with you being from DC and being from the heart of the District of Columbia, Go Go reigns premier, right? So where did the trend, when did you turn to um, wanting to sing songs that would bring people closer to God? Wow. Yeah. You know, I was more so in high school into the R&B thing. That was like, uh, okay. okay. I heard the Go Go, and of course I, I grew up with it. You had Ray Essence and Junkyard. And That's Nick, right. You know. But um, it was more so, you know, it was it was back in Brian McKnight, Voice the Men, you know, <laughs> I was back, you know, down on bended knee, and so, you know, I, you know, I'm a singer, so I wanted to be a croon. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be the next Voice the Men. So, um, but you know, I had an experience with the Lord where, um, He just got a hold to me. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I kind of was doing some things I knew I probably shouldn't have been doing, and. Um, I was doing, I was, I was doing a few wild things. I was kind of out there, especially not according to the way I was raised. I'll put okay. it like that. Okay. Uh, I'll keep it PG. <laughs> but, uh, and and so I just, I had a moment one night where it's like I saw myself um, kind of like going off a cliff, you know. And I just got this sense, like God was saying to me, "Listen, if you don't turn around, you're going to regret it." You know, it was like one of those sobering moments where I really felt like the hand of God, honestly, I feel like the hand of God was like lifted off me. You know, it felt like, and I felt naked, like, oh, man. you know, as a church kid, you kind of, you kind of know grandma's prayers are always kind of on you. You know, you kind of, so you kind of do, do your thing knowing that when people praying for me, I'll be okay. But it just kind of felt like I came to a point in my life where God was like, now it's up to you. You know, what are you going to do? You're a senior in high school. You got some decisions to make. And, um, and so I was in this R&B group at the time, and uh, I felt the Lord saying, it's time to really commit your heart to me. And so I went to the group. I told the guys, I said, hey, man, um, I really feel like I want to I want to really get serious with God. And um, and they understood, surprised me. Wow. Yeah, you know, I was so surprised because because we had just won uh, the uh, showcase at the Blackburn Center on Howard University's campus to uh, sing at the Apollo. And so um, we were we were doing our thing. We used to call it Listen. Uh, well, no, Smooth and Subtle. Now, then they changed their name to Listen. And so um, shout out to School B and Mike and all the crew, man. I think we might have that. No kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just and kidding. So, and so, yeah, so I left right before they went to the Apollo. And of course, they went on to do um, some big things. But um, I had no idea, to be honest with you, that I was going to do gospel music. I just was like, God, I just want to give you my life. Wow. Um, and I hadn't written any songs back then. I was just singing other people's songs. Mm -hmm. And it was when I just told the Lord, I said, here's my life, um, whatever you want to do with it. I kind of played around in school. Um, I, was, I was playing basketball, you know, and, you know, chasing the girls. And I didn't really put my best foot forward in, 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 my, in the classroom. And so I saw a lot of my friends going off to these prestigious colleges. And I was like, man, my choices were kind of limited. <laughs> and I was like, and I said, God, you know what? I don't know what you could do with the rest of my life. You know, but I said, hey, whatever you could do with it, here it is. And I had no idea what he had in store for me. So. How did your friends and associates, I mean, you told us about your group, but how did your friends and associates take that? Because I'm, I'm assuming that most of your friends obviously went to church in some way. Was there any, you know, distance after after you decided to go to that track that you just had? Well, to absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. They they were like, dude, you tripping. You know, and these guys that went to church with me. But again, again, <laughs> because I went to church doesn't mean the church was in me. I was. Okay. I, was I mean. <laughs> I was going to church, but you know, you know. And so um, it was more so out of obligation, you know? And so, yeah, a lot of my friends, you know, really kind of, we kind of, there was a little bit of a distance. And um, it just happens when you really want to get serious with God, you know, people that are kind of okay with where they are, they, they're like, okay, later for that, man. I don't want to go that deep, you know? And I kind of had to walk a little bit, you know, by myself or just, you know, and I found out that you know, I would go to some of the services and it would just be a lot of the, some of the older, the older ones that were there. A lot of my peers weren't there, but then later, um, two, three, four, five years later, God started 
doing something. And like some of my friends started really getting serious with God. And then they started calling me, you wow. know? And I started realizing, man, my decision, and I still have fun. I mean, I still have fun. I just wasn't, I just wasn't but wow. Like I wasn't doing what I was doing. I wasn't disrespecting God's daughters. You know, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't um, out there just trying to, you know, you know, I'll just, I'll just say. I asked that question because, you know, as people tune into today's program, you know, I'm sure there's people at some point in their life that struggle with that very big decision that you had to make and, and feeling alone if they've made that decision and just letting them know that they're not alone. And yeah, you, as you said, Kevin, you're going to, you, you had a period where you felt like you were walking alone. Obviously you weren't, you had God's love embracing you and yeah. I'm sure your family as well, but it's important to talk about those things because right now with so many people being locked in their home because of this COVID-19, I think a lot of people um, are turning to the Bible and turning to church and turning to people who can give them answers. And, you know, with that being said, um, I know you're from the, the DMV DC specifically, how has this pandemic, which seems to be on an uptick now, really affected your family, your community, your career? Well, definitely um, had several engagements to get canceled, of course, you know, because nobody's gathering anymore. So um, I had to kind of navigate that space. But because of beautiful forms like this, platforms like this, you know, we've been able to kind of keep it going. Um, and so I've done a lot of performances virtually, which has been really cool in a way to uh, bring in income. So that's been cool. Uh, as far as um, how it's impacted my family, my wife and I, we we do life together, you know, so and we were doing life together even before um, because she used to manage me, you know, years ago, even before we got married. So it, it wasn't a really a big deal for us to be in the house together because it was like, hey, we, this is my best friend. And so yeah. this is kind of how we were rolling. Um, but to be honest with you, the, the other things that you couldn't do, it did really kind of make you really just like, Lord, what's what's going on? Because there's this uncertainty that I personally, you know, you feel like, man, well, well, when is this going to end? Sometimes you can always you take comfort in knowing, okay, here's the date that it started, but here's the date that it's going to be over. And we haven't really had that. It's been like this open-ended thing. So yeah, I've been doing a lot more, been doing a lot more praying, and a lot more just God, what are you saying? Um, give me some peace in the midst of this situation. Give me some direction. I've had tons of friends of mine conversations where they just kind of freaking out because they're like, man, what do I do? I said, man, we, we got to trust God, you know, because regardless of this catching us by surprise, this didn't catch him by surprise. Absolutely. So your wife, Shondale, there's a little history here. You just mentioned here that you've known her for a long time. She used to be your manager, but can we walk back? So you guys were friends for a number of years and then there was a period that things just turned. So let's share that because you shared it with BB and CC Wannan a few years ago. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, share that with well, us. It, it goes back further than than I even knew. My mom was in her mom's wedding. Wait, wait a minute. We grew up in the same church, even though we didn't flow. The church was pretty big. It was over a thousand, man, over a thousand members. So okay. even though, so we knew of each other, but we weren't stupid duper close as kids. And so, um, yeah, it, it was amazing. So my mom was at her mom's wedding. My dad knew her mom, okay. um, you know, like back in the day, I mean, my dad knew her mom. So, so, so let me see, she started managing me. I used to do these, these like gospel Valentine's day concerts <laughs> every year. Okay. Starting in like 99, first time I did it, we had like, over a thousand people show up at Refreshing Springs, Church of God in uh, Christ in Riverdale, Maryland, right outside of DC, shout out uh, to the uh, Springs family. And so she was there at that one. And shortly thereafter, she started managing. And we worked together for, I think 10, a little over 10 or 12 years before we got married. And we were just brother and sister. I mean, she was overseas quite a bit. She used to work in consulting. With Shell Oil and a lot of different other uh, Fortune 100 companies. So she wasn't even really here on the ground. She just was helping me strategize and making phone calls and stuff like that. But then she came back and was stateside in 2009. 
right when I recorded, no, 2007, right when I recorded my first record. Okay. And, um, and man, I tell you, you know, it just took off from there. And of course, the Heart That Forgives took off and we were all over the place traveling together. And it was in 2010, we, we, we kissed for the first time. But After even, all those years? You know, yeah, because you know, we were just, we were just, we were just brother and sister. I mean, it was, it was platonic. And then, you know, one night, you know, you know, sparks flew and next thing I know, we kissed, but it, even then we were like, you know what? I think we should kind of pump our brakes. Maybe, no, no. Yeah, yeah, it was like, hold on, let me get my, let me get my, no, we got married in 2010. It was on December 10th. So I'm thinking that wasn't 2010, maybe 2008. She, she's probably gonna get me because I'm- getting, <laughs> It's um, okay, you don't have to be exact. But, but, yeah, yeah. but anyway, so we ended up getting married. Um, we ended up getting married December 17, 2010. But I think there's something that you're leaving out here. What's that? Because you you said that not just now, but I was told that you were celibate for a number of years when you were turning your yeah. life around. Yeah, I remember shucks, my senior year of high school. I remember praying a prayer. I was like, God, now if I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live for you. You know, you're gonna have to hurry up and send my wife. This is 1995. I said, you gotta send my wife real quick because you know I can't hold out. <laughs> And I bet you he was in heaven laughing, like, oh no, son. You know, but it was 15 years celibacy. 15, 15 years. Well, to hear that is unbelievable. And you said before, you said you lived a different lifestyle. So to oh, be yeah, I was having sex. And, and, oh, yeah. I, I mean, all and I thought about was sex. Amazing. But, but I stopped, if we can be frank, I stopped going over uh, girlfriend's houses at two in the morning, one in the morning. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I stopped putting myself in the this thing. Then I, I, I want to give myself the best chance. I stopped. I was a little bit more careful. I was a little bit more selective, you know, with kind of how I moved. And but I, can I be honest with you? Even after, um, even after, you know, I started traveling a lot. Yeah. Um, in 2008, 2009, it was rough on the road, you know, because you got you're meeting all these different kind of people and. Yes. My God, man, I, there were times where I was like, God, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could make it. And um, I, listen, I'm just being real. It was tough, man. You know, the Bible says, I'll keep that which, you can, which, which we commit unto him. He'll keep it if we commit it, if we commit our lives, if we commit our bodies. And um, no matter how saved you are, man, you still live in a body that has feelings and emotions and desires. And, and so, you know, I did a lot of fasting and a lot of prayer. And, and just really trying to surround myself with people that can hold me accountable, um, people that would tell me the truth, people that would just, I would tell them what I was going through, they would check in on me, Kevin, how you doing? I know you're out there on the road, how, how, how's everything going? And I would have to be honest with them. That's, that's how I made it. But here's the even more thing. We got married December 17th, 2010. My wife was a virgin when she got married. 38 years old. 30. That is un heard of she's a virgin she's a wow virgin. so that was that so I, so that's a testimony to people to know listen this thing is real god can't keep you if you I mean, listen all i thought about was sex you know i was a teenager that's all i thought about and so for god to keep me wow. i mean that to me was like the biggest miracle other than salvation itself and being filled with the spirit of the lord i mean that right there was a miracle because i didn't know how in the world how in the world he would keep me with, mm -mm. I had to be careful with what I was watching. I'm just trying to help somebody. Sure. If you ask me to live this thing, I had to be careful with what I was watching because, you know, that, that was a window and a door, you know, and um, I just, and by God's grace, we made it to the altar. But that does not have my moments of weakness. That does not mean that I did not have to call. And, you know, Kevin, that's important for people to know that if they're going in, down this path and they're they're trying to get closer to God, that there will be some ups and downs. Looks like we may have lost. Yeah, yeah I'm here. I'm here. All I'm right. just saying that, you know, it's important. I, I love your honesty 
as we have this conversation here about what you went through, because like you said, there's going to be people listening to us and you're going to tell them after experiencing the flesh, you went for 15 years without it, trying to walk and follow God's will. And then you found a bride, a wife who went 38 years. She was a virgin when you got married. These are stuff that people make imaginary movies about, right? You know, you're like, yeah. 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 yeah I told her, I said, it's a whole nother thing, sweetheart. I said, when you have the experience and you got to stop, then when you ain't never had it. But it's both spectrums because it's like for those that are holding you can do that. And for those that experiencing a little technical difficulties, you're tuning in now to fire our special guest is gospel recording artist Kevin Lavar talking to us about his amazing um, relationship with his wife and um, the 15 years of celibacy that he went through after um, you know being an active teenager and finding his wife um, who actually knew her all, pretty much all of his life. They were friends and then they worked together as far as a manager. And then at 38 years old, his wife who was a virgin, they got married. So now I, what I don't know, do you have kids? Say it again. Do you have kids? Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. We have uh, a six year old son, Justice Emmanuel. I love and we that. have identical twin girls, Joy and Victoria. What? Oh, I dad, I know you're busy and I know mommy's busy too. <laughs> we are, listen, we are busy, but it is absolutely amazing. Um, and just, you know, being a dad, man, it's, man, it's such an honor. And, you know, our first one, Facebook, we shared it with our first one. We ended up uh, losing. We missed, you know, my wife miscarried it. Um, you know, that was, that was kind of rough. That was kind of rough. And, and we were able to kind of heal through that and see God's hand and connect with people that have walked through the same kind of thing. Um, because we started late, um, a lot of people, you know, like maybe y'all should go get checked out just to make sure, you know. <laughs> I always want to say that. <laughs> family members were like, Oh, Kev, you know, it's been two plus years. I want you guys to go get checked out. And I said, man, but the day, here's the funny thing. The day that I was scheduled to go into the doctor to get checked out, <laughs> we found out she was pregnant. No, see how God does that. That's what so I'm good. talking about. God is so good. You know, Kevin is a person of faith. You know, how do you f help others find comfort, especially when it deals with the loss or pain of a loved one? God understands and he sees. He's brought me through, um, you know, pain and, and loss, unexpected loss. I remember my grandmother was in perfect health. She was in her man, 70s, if not 80s, and she got hit by a car what? and was taken from us, you know, just like that. And uh, and God brought me through. I remember just like, how do I how do I cope with that? Even as a, a teenager, sure. you know, starting high school, how do I deal with that? And even like I said, even with the loss of our first child that we miscarried, I never met that child before, but I felt that thing. Um, sure. I really felt that thing. I didn't know I was going to feel it that deep, but I grieved for quite a while. And and God, you know, I love God so much because I was angry with God for a while, and and I was, I didn't understand because we prayed and we believed, and and I think a lot of people are kind of dealing with that. They're, they're kind of angry because they're saying, well, why why did you allow this to happen? And and what I know is that God is sovereign and that he understands all, but that this life is temporary. And that, you know, I, I believe with all my heart that this is not the end of our existence. And so I believe I'm gonna see my baby, I really do. Um, and so death, God doesn't view death the way, the way we view death. It's like death is just a separation from this life, but we continue on. And so that's kind of how he, that's kind of how I was able to kind of get through it. Um, because the scripture says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So, you know, I, this can't be it. <laughs> you know, this, this can't be all, you know, so I put my hope and my faith in God's word. And, um, and I've seen God really pull me through some of the toughest times um, when I really didn't think I'd be able to make it. You know, so I, I remember I was up, I was speaking and I had to preach in Seattle 
And this was shortly after, maybe, I don't know, maybe four or five months after we had lost our first child. And my wife was pregnant with my son, Justice. And I was up speaking and the grief of the first child hit me and I began to weep. Oh, man. And so I was like, man, I had no idea. And my wife, after a little bit, God, it comforted her heart. She was okay. She was able to get past it. But for some reason, you know, it took me a little while to get over that. Maybe it was because God wanted me to feel for my other brothers and sisters that I ended up meeting a little bit after that. And we were able kind of to walk through it together because a lot of people, you know, have gone through that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit, you and your wife are in a dynamic team. And I heard that you have an organization called Dream Center out in on the West Coast. Is that still? Well, no, we support it. Yeah, we, we actually, it's not our organization, but we supported this okay. organization called the Dream Center. And um, that's actually where I did the uh, second uh, recording, our second live recording out there in Los Angeles with Pastor Matthew Barnett. It was great. They feed the homeless and they pretty much converted an entire uh, 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 an entire um, uh, hospital into like a life center where they rescue women from sex trafficking. Um, there's a whole floor, like top floor, um, dedicated to girls that have been rescued from sex trafficking. And so we really felt like that was the place to um, do a record called Destiny. You know, letting people know that um, God can, wherever you are, he can pick you up from wherever you are. He can turn your life around. He can clean you up no matter how you feel about yourself. And um, people that have been homeless, drug addicts, you name the prostitutes um, that have gone through things in life, um, they pretty much rehabilitate them and, and try to love them back to life. And so um, we felt like that was a really good partner to connect with them in 20, 2012. We record that. So, matter of fact, this song record, which kind of has like a rock kind of feel to it, but almost like a Bruce Springsteen kind of feel. I'd never <laughs> done a song like that before. And we had them join in, several of the uh, the members of the Dream Center that lived there, and they with us. It's called uh, Born to Be Great. And it's on the uh, the Destiny Live of the Dream Center album. Born to Be Great. I'm going to look at that. So, listen, we, you know, you have. You have your own record label. So I, I wanted, you know, we were offline before we actually opened up the program. We hear a lot of information. There's a lot of courses on how you can get into the business, whether it's rap and R&B and jazz and all the other things that are out there. But it seems like there's not, a, I don't hear a lot about people saying, hey, you know, this is how you can get into the gospel industry. You run your own label. You manage, uh, obviously, artists as well. Tell us a little bit about that side of you, you know, well, um, there's so many different ways. I mean, some people get signed from um, from just the following that they have, uh, you know, on you know Instagram or, or Facebook, and just kind of the buzz. And um, there's some amazing voices out there where that's happened, where you know because of social media, people just you know they put out a song and people just loved it, and then of course they got uh, you know the record deal, the, the you know, record company's attention. Um, a lot of people, though, have gone the independent route. Um, and I, I say this, if you've got something, if you've got something to say, man, God's going to provide an opportunity and an audience um, that, that wants to hear you. And, and he's going to give you a platform. And especially in today where you have the social media, you have, see, back when, when I first got into the industry, we didn't really have, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no Twitter. And so it was a little bit more difficult. You still kind of had to grind it out a little bit. You had to send in, or you had to go to the post office every other week, just every other day, sending in demos, send them waiting to hear back, calling yes. to see if they got you comfortable. And so trying to get into showcases and singing and, ah, do you like me? And, and most times you didn't get a call back. Sometimes, you know, they would use your song, <laughs> you know, and, and not stop you. Uh, but, um, you know, but I, honestly, what would I say? If you're called to it, it's going to find you. Is it still a tough industry? Because I know I've heard over the years, you know, of course, working in radio, I've heard time and time again, artists saying, you know, I get signed on a label and I think, all right, I, I've made it. I'm going to be famous. Then I get in there with the people running the show and they want me to be someone that I'm not. 
That's true too. That's true too. I mean, there are some experiences where, you know, that's not the case where they actually want you to be yourself. Um, but when it depends on how you come in, if you come in with a record that's completely finished, okay. and you do a deal where you say, Hey, um, I just want a license. I've got, you said I, I just want to license it. Album. I've invested in myself or I got somebody to invest in getting the record. Yeah. I just want to license it. And, um, when you partner, when you put the marketing dollars up and we can come in as partners, there's that situation. But then, yeah, you do have situations where the record label, they make the initial investment. They see you have the talent and then they invest in your record. And in those instances, they do have um, more say because it's their money. You know, they're the ones putting a lot of the um, skin in the game. So you could definitely understand that. But it also depends on what deal, what kind of deal you negotiate. Um, okay. you know, Cause you can have, a huge following and so they're like well you know we'll come alongside that because you already have a built-in following if you got a, a few hundred thousand people following you that's a built-in following they can just plug music into they can just kind of you know kind of springboard off, off the platform that you already have even if you don't have a record label yet so um but again i go back to without question if you're called to it it'll find you like God will make sure that that thing finds you. Cause uh, you know, there are tons of people trying to sing, Yes. But, but when you're called to do it, it's like Moses being found in the, in the, in the river, you know, it's just like, what, what, what were the odds that Pharaoh's daughter would find him, but he was the deliverer. So it was ordained. And so for those people that are saying, man, I got this gift. I know God has given me, in time, I would encourage them to say, listen, I promise you in time, you know, your preparation is going to meet opportunity and uh, and it's going to happen. I like that. Your preparation is going to meet opportunity. Listen, we're going to take a second. I want them to hear we have another one of your songs we want to play. You are not alone. And then we're going to talk about it afterwards. OK, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> Kevin, let me With a heavy heart, I begin to pray. Father, give them strength to take. Now I know it won't be an easy road. But you won't have to travel it alone. We vow to stand beside you. Millions are praying for you. We're not going to let you go till you tell.
gonna take it away Just give them your pain, give them your pain Come take it away yeah. You are not alone hey. You are not alone Wow, that is a beautiful, beautiful song. You are not alone. So can I ask, is that the song that you did on the West Coast that had the rock beat to it? No, we did. We went back, that was like 12 years, man. We did that um, when the Virginia Tech shootings took place. Oh, my goodness. Um, and all those people lost their lives. I love. Um, um, I remember I was praying. I was like, God, give me. Yeah. You know, one of the yeah, things that I see for the family, one of the things that I see, Kevin, you're so inclusive. <laughs> Black, white, Asian, young, old. I really love that to see that in your video that everyone can see a person that they can relate to or that looks like them. Yeah. Well, I mean, God, He made everybody, you know. That's and, right. Uh, listen, I tell people, listen, if you got a problem with other races, then you're not gonna like heaven. Because heaven is like Skittles. <laughs> it's like skills up there, you know. So get over this racism now, because you know we're all made of one blood. You know, you know, we, we all bleed red, and so um, yeah. And I love people. When it's all, I remember I was in Los Angeles, and uh, this guy came, this black kid came up to me, and he was like, "Man, man, we love you in Dublin, man. <laughs> they got black people in Ireland." <laughs> You know, isn't it great when you write something and then somebody that you wouldn't expect to reach out to you would say it changed their life, it helped them, it, it got them through something? Absolutely, um, it's humbling. Um, I honestly, I ask God, I say, God, I don't want to, you know, it, to answer your question, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's humbling, it's humbling because uh. You write out of your experience, you know, and, and you're going through something and you have no idea when you put it out whether people are going to like it or not. But when it changes somebody's life, that's when you know God got involved, you know. And that's the same thing with the heart that forgives or even with the song like You Are Not Alone. Like, I think that was like, like number one on the gospel music channel for quite a few weeks. Like people during that time, they were really hurting. And I think it's even, um, it's even, uh, you know, it's even for now. With everything sure. that's happening, people really feel alone. Um, they're in their homes. They can't connect with their friends. They're, you got you got people. You got loved ones whose whose uh, family members are in the hospital right now, and they can't even be by their bedside. You know, that's because right. the doctors won't let them because of the uh, COVID nineteen risk. So, yeah. how do you? Because you said when you started out in the business, you didn't write. You just sang. You, you had a, you know, a calling. God gave you a gift. How did you learn how to write without being so personal about what's happening at home or what you went through? How do you learn to do that? Well, well I, I don't know how to do that because I'm very personal. About it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I just I try to be as honest as I possibly can be. Um, here's, here's the funny thing. and I, God is real. And I want people to know this. It's not about where you start. It's about where you finish. Um, I did not start playing the piano until I was 20 years old. What? 20. Now, this is what happened. This is the God's honest truth. I was at church 20 years old. I gave my heart to God when I was 18. Really. I kind of was raised in the church when we talked about, you know. But I got serious about God when I was 18. At 20 years old, I remember being at a church service, a Pentecost revival service, and it hadn't started yet. And people were kind of trickling in. And I happened to be sitting down at the piano. This yeah. kind of fucking, I was saying to myself, how in the world do they make the black keys work with the white keys? And I was bang, 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 just messing around. Service hadn't started yet. 
And this evangelist, this preacher from out of town, and Elder Loggins, I'll never forget. He was there and he was supposed to be a speaker that night. And I just felt prompted in my heart to ask him to pray for me that God would bless me and give me the gift to play the piano. What? And I went up to him and I said, hey, I was wondering how long this. I just, I really want to play the piano and would you pray for me? He looked at me and he says, I'm going to do that for you. And he didn't pray for me right then. And I was like, oh, okay. I thought I was going to get it right there. He's like, I'm going to do that for you. And I happened to see him like a week or two later in a random like noonday prayer service. And he was still in town. And when he saw me, I was walking out and he was just kind of praying for people as they were leaving. And when he got to me, he looked me in my eyes and said, watch out. You're going to be playing that piano. I was working at a before and after school care program at an elementary school around the corner from the church, about five minutes from the church. And I would, after the, the parents would um, come and get their kids, I would stick around and play on the little piano. After about three months, the parents thought I'd been playing for years. No way. And so from tw- and I remember I was 20 years old, and I remember people told me, hey, man, don't try to, don't try to learn an instrument at 20. Man, you too old. Just keep singing, Kevin. You really know how to sing. You know, I was already starting to write songs, but I really felt like, Playing the piano was a, like a part of my call. Like it was like, because I could hear the music. And so I would sit down with keyboard players and I would have a song that I wrote from start to finish and they would be playing chords. And I would say, yeah, not that chord. Don't do minor, do major. Oh yeah, not that chord. Okay, turn that right there. Let's do that chord again. So I was actually giving them, I had it in me. It just hadn't worked its way out to my fingers yet. And then, um, and so I would go to noonday prayer. This is my routine. Cause you still gotta put the time. In. I would go to noon. I would leave work, um, go to lunch break, go to noonday prayer, and then I would go up to the main sanctuary and I would just practice. And I would practice, and it went from three finger chords to <laughs> five finger chords, and I was like, oh my god! It's like I was opening up a gift, and it was, it was from God. And I realized that when He prayed for me, God gave me the gift to compose. And so I hear all kinds of music. I mean. If you listen to the Destiny record, there's, there's blues on there, there's rock on there, there's country, there's worship, there's, I mean, like R&B, feel, it's pop, it's everything. Like I hear all these different genres. I love it. I love it. Would you quickly share the story about um, a girl in your high school who basically confronted you and said that you need to change your ways? And then oh. I think you sought her out later. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, well. Her name, what's up, Robin? Her name is Robin Sugarworth. I remember I was in high school now. I'm going to get the story right this time. I think I was in 11th grade. <laughs> she was a senior, and Robin was known. Robin was for Jesus. I mean, she was for Jesus, you know. I mean, ever since I've known her, she's been for Jesus. And she used to sing all over the city. And um, she one day, and I know it was the Lord because she didn't know me like that. <laughs> she, when I was in sin, she... she <laughs> Called me in the toward the back of the auditorium and she says, You know better. She was like, You, you're not like everybody else. She said, Kevin, you know the world. Like, you know, she said, God's got more for you. you you're, you're, she's basically saying, You're living beneath beneath your, your privilege. Like, you've got more to do for God. And she said, It's time that you, and she really, she made an impression on me in a way that I was like, Man. I mean, but I didn't change immediately. Okay. I never forgot. A year later, I actually got serious about God. Now, check this out. So that was 1994. Here it is. I tried for years after I got saved and really gave my heart to God. Excuse me, tried for years to locate her. I couldn't find her. I tried for years. And, um, I um, couldn't find her, and I didn't know. I looked on fa- Facebook. I, I thought I found her on Facebook. Um, tried to send her a direct message, never heard a response. I was like, man, maybe, maybe it's just not meant to be. So you think that's '94? So since '94, right? Um, it was time for me to do this next this this live recording. I just recorded my third live recording last year at the City of Praise. Shout out to to Bishop Joel and Yolanda people. <laughs> um, I did uh, a live recording. And I thought to myself, I would love to 
find Robin and have her to sing with me for my live recording. Oh. So you know that I was able to reach her. When she called me, I we talked on her birthday. On her birthday, she called me on her, I had no idea that I was reaching out to her on her birthday. So what's that, like what? 2019, I don't know, 25, 26 years later? What? And, and she was just floored. She's like, now she didn't know. She had been, my, my full name is Kevin LeVar, correct? I went out as Kevin LeVar because there's another gospel artist who I so respect out of Chicago, phenomenal artist, his name is Kevin Gray. So anyway, so she thought, she had no idea that the persons whose music she had been listening to all these years was actually the same guy <laughs> that she had actually witnessed to 20 mm. something years earlier, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's just absolutely amazing. So she, she sang at my live recording and when I tell you this song that we did together, it is absolutely amazing. I can hardly wait for everybody here. What's it called? Um, it's called "If You Want to Be Delivered," but I think we're gonna call it "Why Not Tonight." Then Why not? Why, it, I'm writing this down. Why not tonight? Why not tonight? Then we're gonna now, call it "Why Not Tonight." Now, speaking of that, are you working on something we should be looking out for? <laughs> you should. Oh, absolutely. There's a record, like I said, that we recorded last year. Um, it's called. Well, there's a song on the record that I, that has just really, you know, it's really been my my life story for these last, you know you know, maybe 10 months, 12 months, and it's called um, The Only Thing That Matters. And mm -hmm. so I think we're gonna call the record The Only Thing That Matters live in DC. And um, man, listen, this thing has some go-go on it. It's got some worship on it. It's got some reggae on it. It's it's for the islands. It's for, it's we gonna party. Um, it's just a record I think that people are just gonna love from young and old, it's my, I think personally, it's my best record that I've ever done. Um, we had some phenomenal musicians on it. It is just, I'm so excited about it. So um, I'm moving to Texas. And so I'm gonna be finishing up the record actually in Dallas. Uh, this okay. summer. And uh, so God say the same, I will be trying to put it out probably in the fall. So how can we stay connected with you and then when it's out, know where to find you and where we can support you? Well, um, so much. We got to make sure we, we got we to stay connected. There's so much happening. Yes. Uh, so definitely Twitter. Uh, I am Kevin LeVar. That's our handle on Twitter. Um, Instagram is the real Kevin LeVar. And of course, Facebook. We got a couple of Facebook pages. Kevin LeVar and One Sound. It's so much. My, my wife and I, we wrote a film. It's a whole lot happening. I know we didn't get an opportunity to talk about that, but we wrote a movie together about three years ago, and God has really connected us with some phenomenal people in Hollywood. And so um, I did a couple of songs for some films. Matter of fact, a, a song that I wrote, A Heart That Forgives, was made into a film by a friend of mine, um, Ken Jenkins, out of Dallas. And so I put, yeah, I put my, I allow him to use. Um, some of my songs for his film, but my wife and I actually wrote a movie ourselves, which has gotten some serious attention from some major players in Hollywood, and we are really excited about that. And so, so when it's ready to come out, you're going to be on here first, right? I, listen, <laughs> we're trying to go into the world, like we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to reach people that would never step foot in a church. Mm -hmm. We're trying to give them the power, the love of God, let them know that there's hope. And so if I could just say this one thing, though, um, I had a friend of mine who used to sing with me, passed away and um, unexpectedly. And um, and so I believe that he, um, um, you know, used to come to a depression or whatever. And, and so I was writing a song. I had no idea he was dealing with it. And uh, I was writing a song called Intervene. And Intervene deals with, uh, you know, just giving up, giving up on life. And the lyric says, um, um, intervene. Someone's contemplating ending things. They're walking out before the final scene, not knowing things won't work out like they seem. Father, would you intervene? Um, Father, would you let them know that this ain't the end of the show? There's an encore that's to live for. Please intervene. 
you know, and so there, I cannot wait. I'm, I'm probably going to do that song probably while we're in Dallas as well, do it with the orchestra. But there's so many people in times like these that are waking up and trying to find a reason to keep on living. Hmm. And so I just want to encourage you. God sees you. He cares about you. He knows where you are. This is not the end. Please do not allow the enemy to lie to you to make you think that the best of your life is behind you because it isn't true. Um, God's got some greater things in store for you. And I want you to know if nobody has told you today that they love you, I want you to know that I love you. And that's ah, Kevin, I love it. I love it. No, we have a few more minutes before we wrap things up, but I have to ask you about one quickly, who inspired you and who would you like to work with today? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, the list. Marvin <laughs> Wyman is one of the most phenomenal singers that I've ever heard. He is one of the most phenomenal singers. I grew up on the Winans. I grew up on uh, Commission. And oh, okay. um, I mean, just, I grew up. And he's this guy that I'm about to say is around my age, but he's been doing it for so long. And I love his voice and his teacher hat. Oh, a lot of music. Yes. He was very different coming out, and he was okay. He didn't mind being different. Yes, absolutely love, 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 love his music. Um, a lot then, of energy. I love the, the the worshipers, man. I love, of course, Natasha Cobbs, but I love the Kerry Jobs. I love the Kim Walkers, man. I love okay. the Bethel music. You know, the, the Bethel music. You know, the worship. Those are uh, those, and so I'm. You know, I'm kind of now. If you go on the secular side of things. You know, <laughs> I love the artistry, love the artistry of uh, Ray Charles. Oh, okay. You know, um, I, love, I love, there's an artist called Johnny Lang, uh, okay. White Song. Yes, a, yes. A yes. And he's got a voice that just, man, sings yes. like he don't care. Okay. And I yes. love it, you know, so I can definitely appreciate it. And if you want me to go back, I mean, I love Frank Sinatra, man. Oh, you know, right. I love his voice. You know, I love his voice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're a true music connoisseur. So again, real quick, where can we keep in touch with you, follow and, and, and get your album once it comes out? Um, Facebook, like I said, Kevin LeVar One Sound. We've got a couple of pages. I think you can still follow us on a few. Um, Instagram is the real Kevin LeVar. Uh, and Twitter is I am Kevin LeVar. And I really, really, really appreciate y'all having me. This has been so much fun. You're the first gospel singer, artist on fire <laughs> on this show. So we are so honored to have you here. We can't wait to hear um, more from you and follow you. And when that movie comes out, we expect, or before it comes out, we expect to talk to you about that, especially yeah. since it's a collab with your wife. We really, really have to thank you for, for you know, being a part of the show and, and spreading the word Um of God to those who may not have heard it and those who may be struggling because you can accept them and you fall back. We're all humans, right? So it's good to know that, you know, he'll, he'll take you when you're ready. He'll take well, you. And, and listen, you can get back up again. If I, if I could say this, you know what I'm saying? We had a couple, a little bit of latitude. Now, let me just say this. There's a song I wrote called um, Your Destiny. Okay. I wrote that song when I was on the road and I was struggling with this thing called Jesus and Christianity and struggling with living a life that was pleasing to God. And that song, God gave it to me as like a lifeline. And, you know, I was struggling and God let me know, listen, I love you. I'm with you. Even if you fall, even when you fall, you can get back up again. And so a lot of people, I got to the point, I got to the point where, you know, I, I kept falling to the point when I say falling, you know, there are other things that you could do that are still just as wrong as if you did, you know, you know, you fornicated or whatever. And so I was still sinning sometimes, you know, and I was struggling. I'm just being honest. I was struggling. And I and I, I prayed to God and God gave me this song. And he, he really helped me to understand that, you know, people fall. You know, the righteous man fall, what, you know, what, seven times, eight times, he gets back up again. That's right. And so, um, and so just to let you know, don't quit just because it's hard. You know, um, it's not about the fact that you make a mistake. Just don't practice sin. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know, you know, practice righteousness. 
don't practice sin. Practice doing what's right. But if you make a mistake, and I'll say this, when my child was learning how to walk, I did not get upset when they stumbled. All I did was- Great analogy. All I did was I got them, I said, hey, you can do it. Why? Because I knew that they were going to learn how to walk, but I had to be patient with them. God is patient with you. He's not upset with you just because you stumble. He's excited that you're trying to walk. So please be encouraged. Kevin Lavar, not only are you a phenomenal singer, I mean, you real your voice is really beautiful. It is a beautiful voice. That like roughness part of it, and this then then you get the smooth melodies. You're incredible. I'll continue following you, and I know so will many of our viewers. Um, I really appreciate this. And before we wrap things up, I want to remind everybody that the NNPA is going to have their convention virtually next week, July 8th and 9th. By the way, it's also the 193rd year of the Black. Press of America. And in addition to that, it's also the 80th anniversary of NNPA. Kevin LeVar, thank you for being on fire. <laughs> With well, thank you for having me. Well, I'm Taylor Thomas. We hope to see you the same time, same place next week.